the princess and I have just returned from a seven-day Alaska cruise with Holland America Line. Even though we've been on over 35 cruises in the past, this is the first time ever sailing with the brand. So how did it compare to our previous cruise experiences? Well, we share all the details next in our exclusive Holland America Line cruise review. Hey everyone, DB here from Eat Sleep Cruise, where we help you see the world one port at a time. And before we dive into our review, we'd love to hear from you. Let us know in the comment section below if you have ever sailed with Holland America Line. One thing I love about cruising is the food. So why don't we start with the dining on Holland America Line. Now on New Amsterdam, the main casual dining venue was the Lido Market. This restaurant served breakfast, lunch, and dinner and offered predictable food selections. Now, what we did like about this cruise ship buffet was that there was actually a menu available in the app. So you could see what was being offered for each meal before heading up to deck nine. For the most part, breakfast was the same each day, including a custom omelet bar. Now we also enjoyed lunch and dinner options in Lidl Market. For lunch, my go-to was either a deli sandwich or the Asian selections from one of the distant lands areas. Everything I tried there from fried rice to lo mein to the sweet and sour pork was delicious. Other options for both dinner and lunch include custom pasta stations and made to order salads. Overall, while the main entree selections were a bit less than buffets on other contemporary cruise ships, food quality was certainly better than the competition. We also found the layout pretty easy to navigate. Now, other casual spots include the New York pizza near the aft pool and the diving grill with burgers, dogs, and chicken sandwiches near the Lido pool. For us, dive-in was one of the better burger joints on a cruise ship Though the New York pizza was a bit of a letdown, especially after enjoying Alfredo's on our princess cruise just a few weeks prior. The main dining room was open every day for breakfast. It was also open five out of seven days for lunch with mostly the same menu. We dined in the MDR once for lunch and twice for breakfast. The menu for breakfast is quite impressive. With unique offerings from omelets to banana bread French toast and hearty skillets, you'll enjoy starting your day off here. Equally vast is the lunch menu. It offers more options than any MDR lunch we have seen on a cruise ship in some time. With a few brunch items, a selection of salads, sandwiches, and entrees, it was difficult to make a decision. My chicken and waffles was a sweet and savory entree. The princess actually did two of the starters, the chicken tacos and the barbecue spring rolls, both of which she enjoyed. Now in all honesty, we only dine in the main dining room once for dinner. And honestly, this one visit did not impress us. The dinner menu seemed really small in comparison to the breakfast and lunch menus. Unfortunately, this was one of our least favorite dinners of the entire cruise. Of course, dining here for dinner a few more times would have given us a better assessment of the main dining room experience, as the first night of the cruise is always a bit off anyway. So it looks like we'll need to book another HAL cruise to truly test out the MDR. Now, full disclosure, we were guests of Holland America Line on this trip. So we were treated to all three specialty restaurants during the cruise. In addition, we were able to sample the Rudy Seldemar menu one evening at the Pinnacle Grill. So while we didn't get a good representation of the main dining room, we got a complete experience of the specialty dining on Holland America Line. We are happy to report that the specialty restaurants on board were all excellent. In fact, the specialty dining experience on this ship might be some of the best specialty dining we've had at sea. The new Amsterdam cruise ship steakhouse is the Pinnacle Grill. This venue is similar in price point to other cruise line steakhouses. However, it surpassed many of them when it came to food quality. The signature candy bacon starter was amazing and my filet was one of the best steaks I've ever had at sea. The Pan Asian restaurant Terramin is a venue we could visit multiple times on a cruise. From the lobster and shrimp pot stickers to the tempura to the chicken sautés and even the crab fried rice, I was in heaven. Now, when it comes to value, perhaps the best specialty dining deal is the Italian restaurant Canalino's. The specialty restaurant delivered an upscale meal well worth the cover charge. Now, while the location in the buffet lacks a bit of ambiance, the venue more than delivers with its menu. With grilled calamari and rich, creamy buffalo mozzarella as apps, you won't be disappointed. Then there is the braised short rib gnocchi and the homemade pasta genovisa, which were both equally delicious. The tiramisu dessert too was a well-made version of this classic dish. Finally, Rudy's delivered succulent and fresh seafood with an artful presentation. Now for us, it's a bit pricey, but it's a must for seafood lovers. 
with sweet crab as an appetizer and a perfectly seasoned lobster tail, I was more than impressed. That says a lot coming from a New Englander who gets some of the best seafood back home. Topping off this dinner with profiteroles, it was a three course masterpiece. There are two pool areas on Holland America's New Amsterdam. Both of these were rather plain with little theming or decor. Only one of these pools, the aft located Sea View Pool, is an outdoor pool. During our trip, there were no loungers set up near this pool though. While this was a cold water cruise, being an Alaskan cruise, there were at least two days that the temperatures were sunny and warm enough to be outside. A few people did use the hot tubs near this pool, but we rarely saw anyone actually in the pool. However, many people congregated at the outdoor tables to enjoy the good weather on those days. The midship covered pool, the Lido pool, felt more like a typical cruise ship solarium. Although this pool does have a retractable roof, so it was not as stuffy as some other indoor pool areas on cruise ships. This pool was enjoyed by cruisers for swimming or lounging in one of the hot tubs. So this made the adjacent seating area and dining areas near this pool a bit crowded, especially on sea days. Overall, we felt the new Amsterdam cruise ship could have used more outdoor space. While the setup is fine in Alaska, we can imagine the aft deck would get very crowded in warmer regions like the Caribbean. Now, New Amsterdam holds about 2,100 passengers, and on our cruise, we are about 70% capacity with around 1,400 travelers. Overall, over 83% of the guests on our sailing were aged 50 or older. So it's not surprising that the cruise ship didn't feature amenities like a rock climbing wall, ropes course, or surf simulator. Still, officially, there's a sports deck on deck 11. The activities team did sponsor games like around the world basketball competitions or pickleball. On deck nine, there are also two makeshift ping pong tables near the Lidl pool and some shuffleboard on deck 10. Again, when you factor in the itinerary, lack of outdoor sports and activities is not too surprising. Of course, there's also a fitness center on the ship, which is well equipped for a ship of this size. In addition, there is a walking running track that goes all around deck three. This walking track was a frequent spot for morning or afternoon walks or runs. We were on the fifth cruise back for Holland America Line in 2021. So we anticipate that the crew would be back to their regular routines. For the most part, we were correct. Throughout the ship, the service was timely. The staff seemed to have adjusted to any changes in the procedures and protocols. There were plenty of waiters and food servers in the buffet and lounges. And most of the crew were friendly and speedy, delivering service with a smile. Service in the main dining room and specialty restaurants was also on par with other cruise lines. While we often dined as a large group, our servers were friendly and very accommodating. The cruise line did a great job of meeting any dietary needs and delivering exquisite dining experiences in about two hours. Our stateroom attendant, Gusty, made up our room once a day per the new procedures. We never really saw him or had any issues, so that ranks as a win in our book. At other venues, we would say the service was functional, guest services seemed well-staffed. As coffee lovers, we visited the Explorations Cafe on Deck 11 multiple times a day. Here, we felt the cruise ship could have used some additional help. The staff felt a little overwhelmed. Although overall, service met our expectations for a contemporary cruise line. Overall, there were nine bars on the ship. Now for the most part, many of the bars lacked distinct character or theming. Now this wasn't true in the gallery bar. This deck two location was a hidden gem. The oversized seats and large couches gave this lounge an upscale parlor room feeling. Not to mention the signature cocktails like the Hemingway Daiquiri or the Manhattan, which were among some of our favorites. The Billboard Lounge was more of an open bar, which also served some of our favorite drinks of the cruise. With abundant seating and bright, warm colors, it had a very inviting atmosphere. Similarly, the Tamarind Bar on Deck 11 midship offered amazing views with a 180 degree forward facing wall windows. Now, most of the other bars were pretty interchangeable. Almost every venue offered a small signature cocktail menu, and at all bars, cruisers could still order from the ship's standard menu. In the evenings, there was a variety of venues hosting different entertainment. For the most part, these shows and artists focused on various types of music. The main venues and lounges for entertainment were mostly found on deck two. This meant it could get crowded in some of the limited walkways and entranceways to some of these venues. The main stage was a ship's theater. 
and hosted different entertainment each evening. For many of the shows, there were two show times at 7 p.m. and 9 p.m. to accommodate different dining times. The Step One Dance Company offered three production shows on our cruise. Our favorite by far was Humanity, which occurred on the first gala night, night two. A heartwarming theme with engaging special effects and modern music made the show a real standout. On the last night of the cruise, the troupe debuted a new show in tandem. Now this was a more traditional cruise production show, which featured three live singing performances. And it was another show that we really liked as well. The Lincoln Center stage featured classical music by a quartet. This venue was smaller than we expected, meaning it was often hard to get a good seat for some of the more popular themed shows. Similarly, at BB King's Blues Club, each night you could dance away the several different theme sets by the all-star band. Some of these shows included soul music, funky 70s, Memphis Nights, and others. On several nights, there was also live comedy. During our cruise, there were two different comedians, which offered a standard set and then a more adult set. We liked the small, intimate setup of this location, but honestly, for either music or comedy, it was often standing room only. It would have been nicer to offer a few more show times to spread out the crowds. Other nightly piano music occurred in the Billboard Lounge. This piano bar featured two performers. Often, each night, there was a series of predetermined sets. From chart toppers to the British Invasion, it was a very diverse set list. Later in the evening was the duo's all request sessions. Sadly, we never stayed up long enough to see if these performances felt more like your typical dueling pianos. We stayed in cabin 4137. This starboard side aft cabin is categorized as a VB stateroom. According to Holland America Line's website, the sizes of veranda cabins can range from 213 to 379 square feet with the veranda. Now, our cabin certainly felt larger than comparable stateroom cabins our Norwegian Cruise Line and Princess Cruises. When entering the room, our bathroom was on the left and a wall of closets was on our right. We did like the ability to customize the setup of the shelves in the closet. Overall, the space felt about the same as most cruise ships, although the bathroom was larger with more of a square design. There was a full tub in the shower offering more space than your average cruise ship shower. The layout provided about the same vanity space near the sink, but overall there was more real estate to help individuals get ready in the morning. Inside the cabin, the bed was immediately following the bathroom on the forward wall on the left side. It faced aft toward an LCD television mounted on the wall. There were two nightstands, each with some drawers, and USB outlets, giving us additional storage and allowing us to charge our phones each evening. There was also a small desk, which became a hidey spot for the cruise, although I was able to use one of the corner shelves as my gear and charging station for all our devices. A love seat with a table was directly behind the desk. Now, when it comes to balcony size, ours was just right. It offered an open layout with two loungers and a table. As a nice touch, the loungers also came with ottomans. So in theory, one could actually lay out on the balcony. Now, instead of laying out, we actually used it to admire the amazing scenery during the sail-ins and sail-outs, as well as some of the scenic cruising during our voyage. Similar to all our cruises so far this year, Holland America Line had several COVID-19 protocols and procedures in place. Prior to even boarding the ship, all eligible cruisers need to be vaccinated and need to arrive with a negative COVID-19 test. Further, there are now assigned boarding times. Luckily, we were assigned to Group A boarding. This meant we could be among the first cruisers to board the ship once it was cleared around 11.30 a.m. So when we arrived at the terminal around 10.45 a.m., we were allowed to enter and complete the check-in process. It was quick and efficient, taking no more than 15 minutes despite the added verification steps. Once our group was called, we walked right onto the ship with no line. A week later, disembarkation was similarly efficient and well organized. Even with the ship sailing at 70% capacity, there were no issues. We did port valet, which meant we walked off with just our carry-on bags. As part of the independent group, we were able to leave our stateroom around 8 a.m. From leaving the cabin to scanning off the ship and getting through customs, it was less than 15 minutes. 
this embarkation at the ports of call was simple too. While they were short lines at some destinations, it never took more than a few minutes to scan off or on the ship at any of our Alaskan stops. Now this Alaska cruise was a round trip from Seattle and stopped at four ports of call. Juneau, Icy Strait Point, Sitka, and Ketchikan. The cruise also included a morning of scenic cruising in Glacier Bay National Park. On day three of our cruise was our first port of call, Juneau. It was a late day stop from 1 p.m. to 10 p.m. Now, originally we had planned for a rather leisurely day walking around downtown. However, the wife also decided she was going to put us on the wait list for the Tracy Arm Fjord Glacier Explorer, which takes you to Sawyer Glacier from Juneau. Now, as luck would have it, we learned the day before that slots had opened up for the tour. So my nice relaxing day ashore was now hijacked by a seven hour excursion. Now, at least it was a warm and sunny day. Meeting our tour group on the pier, we were escorted to a nearby vessel run by Allen Marine Tours. From there, we were ready to set off on a sightseeing adventure. This seven hour tour would take us into Tracy Elm Fjord, which was about an hour and 45 minutes from Juneau. From there, it would be another 45 minutes down to the South Sawyer Glacier. With close to a 70 degree sunny day, this long boat ride wasn't all that bad. During our trip out the fjord, our naturalist Robert offered intermittent narration, a few jokes, and was a resident bartender, finally passing the buoys that marked the entrance to the fjord and where glaciers used to reside until the 1800s. This is where the real fun began. Passing waterfalls and other scenic landscapes, as well as having wildlife sightings from sea lions soaking up the rays to mountain goats darting the hillside, it was unbelievable. Now, as we got closer to the glacier, the captain warned us that there was a lot of ice, so he was gonna try his best to get as close as possible. Luckily, our boat got within about a quarter mile of this majestic natural wonder. As close to a mile wide, with peaks rising up to 800 feet above sea level, our boat weaved in and out of the floating ice to get closer than we even expected. After having an amazing time, I guess that's why there's a waiting list for this tour. Now, the boat spent about an hour where we were able to take photos and videos, and we could sense everyone's excitement on the vessel. The combination of favorable sea conditions and warm weather meant we could all marvel at this glacier for some time. So even though I was looking forward to a more relaxing, low-key day in Juneau, I'm very thankful that we actually put ourselves on the waiting list for this tour, as it was certainly one of the most memorable shore excursions we've ever been on. Now the next morning on day four was our scenic cruising in Glacier Bay National Park. Now during our cruise on Princess Cruises a few weeks prior, we got an unbelievably sunny day. Unfortunately, on Holland America Line, our trip into Glacier Bay National Park was not as clear. We woke up around 6.30 a.m. to cloudy skies and some thick fog. So we thought the morning was going to be a complete wash. Like our other crews, the major glacier viewing was between 9 and 11 a.m. After doing some work and grabbing breakfast, we got to the first major glacier sighting of the Lampplug Glacier. While still pretty foggy, you were able to see the glacier as New Amsterdam was able to get pretty close. By 11 a.m., the ship had arrived at the Marjorie Glacier and it was pretty viewable from the port side. So this time we trekked out to the covered decks on deck three for some videos and photos. Then we went back to our cabin as the ship completely turned around so both sides of the ship get a view of the glacier and repeated the same process. The ship began exiting Glacier Bay National Park around noon. And as part of the total program, there were actually two enrichment talks, one at 1.30 and another one by a local Klingit native at 2 p.m. Now later on day four, we had a short four hour stop at Icy Strait Point. Now this is one location we've never been to before. So we made sure to book a shore excursion and we had plans to explore the port on our own. Now we had heard from other travelers that Icy Strait Point was a cruise line developed port of call. So it's almost like a private island you might find in the Bahamas or the Caribbean. Still, we're excited for this new destination to visit. When the ship was cleared by 6 p.m., we were some of the first people off to venture around the wilderness. With a few restaurants, a gift shop, a 
pure sidebar with fire pits, and an aerial gondola set amongst the forest, it offers just enough experience for a short stop. It's home to a cannery museum, some walking trails, and the main attraction, the Zip Rider. At just over a mile long, riders zip down this track from a 1300 foot elevation at speeds of up to 60 miles per hour. So of course you knew that shore excursion was the one we booked. So we had about an hour to explore the port of call before we had a check in for our tour. Now currently it's a 40 minute bus ride from the base camp up to the loading platform for the zip rider. Now the cruise lines are building a tram that will actually take people from the base camp up to the zip rider in only seven minutes. And that's supposed to open for 2022. Once we got dropped off by the bus, there was actually this unexpected quarter mile walk down a rather steep and slippery hiking trail. Our group of approximately 30 was divided into small groups of six riders for the return zip down the hillside. After some basic safety instructions, we were loaded into our harnesses and set off for the fastest 90 seconds of our lives. <laughs> On day five was our next port of call, Sitka. While we've sailed to Alaska a few times now, this was our first ever visit to the small Alaskan city. Thus, before the cruise, we booked the aptly named Best of Sitka Tour. This full day of sightseeing and wildlife exploration was scheduled to depart at 8.30 a.m., basically right after the ship was expected to be cleared. With the all clear announcement made, we joined the masses exiting the ship and we easily found our tour provider, as it was the group with the largest line. Once everyone arrived, we were ushered to the next dock to begin the five plus hours of exploring Sitka waters and city highlights. Now the tour was basically divided into three portions. The first portion was an approximately two and a half hour sea otter and whale watching boat tour. The captain and onboard naturalist delivered with several wildlife sightings. Along with a large raft of sea otters, there were also several humpback whales in the nearby sound, with plenty of fluking and spouting off in the distance, as well as near the ship. Disembarking the boat at Centennial Hall, we met Justin, our quirky tour guide and bus driver. He would usher us around the city at our next two stops for the remaining two and a half hours or so of the tour. His unique personality, along with your typical historical narration, made for an interesting city tour. While learning about the Russian influence and the history of Sitka, we passed several of the city's major landmarks. The 15 minute ride took us to the next stop, the Fortress of the Bear. This animal refuge is home to rescued black and brown bears. With our tour running late, we had only about 30 minutes to spend here, but honestly, that was really all we needed. The refuge is a great place to see these beautiful creatures up close and personal, albeit it's really just a glorified zoo. With a steady flow of tour groups, you need to get your photos and videos of the bears and then basically move on. Staff are present to provide impromptu presentations and offer some basic facts about the animals. Following this portion of the tour, we took another 10 minute ride to our next stop. And dispersed with personal and state history from our guide along the way, we arrived at the Alaska Raptor Center. Here, we had about an hour to learn more about the nonprofit's work and view some of the birds on site. The center is home to the largest raptor rehabilitation program in the country. With the ability to rehab up to 200 raptors, such as eagles, hawks, and owls, the center also offers educational programs. Our visit included a narrated tour of one of the training areas, as well as a presentation with one of the permanent eagle residents, Spirit. We also had some time to walk around the grounds on our own to check out some of the other residents. When given the option to get dropped off downtown, or to take the same bus back to the ship, we opted to stay on board and head back to New Amsterdam after a long day of sightseeing. On day six was our last port of call, Ketchikan. Now during our previous stop in Alaska's first city, it was a bright and sunny day, which of course is very rare. So when we woke up to find that it was not raining, we couldn't believe our luck. For this stop, we booked a morning tour, which was a bear watching nature walk. Exiting the ship, we easily found our shore excursion guide and then boarded a bus for the approximately 30 minute ride to the Alaska Rainforest Sanctuary. As luck would have it, it was lightly drizzling but still pretty overcast when we arrived at the sanctuary. 
The 90 minute walking tour occurred on private property and was mostly on man-made walking paths and a raised boardwalk not too far from civilization. Of course, we knew all of these facts ahead of time. Worried we might not find any wildlife, we didn't have to wait long at all. Unlike our previous Neats Bay bear watching cruise, this time around there were plenty of black bear sightings within minutes of entering the sanctuary. It was amazing to see these massive creatures in their natural setting. From bears climbing trees to those hunting salmon in the stream, we were only a few feet away from these bears. As a precaution, at one point, the guide actually did not let us proceed along the platform as she was worried that the bear could climb up given its proximity to a fallen tree. After our off full of bear sightings near the stream, we continued along the path towards a hatchery and a satellite campus of the Alaska Raptor Center. Here, we got up close and personal with another resident, a female bald eagle named Sitka, and some other raptors on the property. Lastly, the tour concluded next to a local totem pole craftsman's workshop. This facility is also home to an old sawmill, some totems on display, and a gift shop. Thanking our guides, we browsed the property, taking some photos of some of the exhibits and totem poles, as well as browsing the gift shop. It was about 20 to 30 minutes until our bus was called that it was time to return to the ship. Now, not going to pass up a dry day and catch a can, once we returned to the ship, we spent a little bit over an hour exploring the downtown area, walking up and down Creek Street, as well as taking a few of the sites on Front Street. And there you have it. That's our exclusive Holland America Line cruise review. Now, what did you think of our review? Let us know in the comments section below if you agree with our analysis of the cruise line. I'm DB from Eat Sleep Cruise, and if you enjoyed this video, we have tons of other cruise reviews right here on the channel including our recent Princess Cruises Alaska cruise review, as well as cruise reviews from other sailings this year, including the first cruise on Royal Caribbean's Adventure of the Seas, and the first cruise from the US in over a year on Celebrity Cruises Celebrity Edge. If you're not already doing so, make sure to follow us all over social media at Eat Sleep Cruise, where we share our latest cruise news, cruise ship reviews, updates, tips, and more.